points to consider uh, God's purpose for the world and for every one of us. So if we want to know why we're on this world, what the creator has in store for us and why he created this world for us, the Old Testament explains that in great detail for us. It also gives us a glimpse of the kingdom that God has promised that will come. And that is one of the topics that we will be going over tonight. It defines Satan and sin. And when we consider the New Testament readings, when it talks about Beelzebub, the devil, Satan, and many others. And when we come to Revelation, I believe that having a good understanding of what God defines sin and Satan in the Old, in the Old Testament is very required for going forward and what a lot of denominations and different Christian sects get wrong. The main point of the Old Testament is the foretelling of Jesus. And this is the first slide that we'll be considering next. It also contains the promises and prophecies made to the many people of the Old Testament, some of which have come to pass, some of which we are still waiting for. It also sets out examples of actual people, which I believe is crucial. But we can see how people who followed God lived their lives and how they also made mistakes and how they're able to return to God afterwards and seek forgiveness. And the types of lives that different people went through as well, that each of us have our own different lives and certain aspects of the characters in the Old Testament appeal to more people. There are many other points to consider, but these were just a few that I thought would be good to go through. So the foretelling of Jesus is the central aspect of the Old Testament. And therefore, that's one of the reasons that I wanted us to have a reading of Luke chapter 24. Because although we're talking about the Old Testament, it is good still to consider what Jesus and the New Testament says. So in Luke chapter 24 and verses 32, I'm kind of hoping we can achieve that with this talk tonight, although I do not think to quite the same degree. So Luke chapter 24 and verse 32, it says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And the very scriptures that Jesus was teaching to them at this point was the Old Testament. And if Jesus was able to impel to his disciples the Old Testament in such a degree that their hearts burned within them, how much more is it more important to us as well? These disciples have been with Jesus throughout his entire three and a half year ministry. And yet this talk on the road with Jesus motivated them more than anything that they had heard from him previously and he'd gone through the entire old testament it just shows how much god has written for us in the books how much god has revealed to us and it's motivated them so much that not only have they realized that christ was raised but the very reason for why he was done why he was raised which was talked about in the old testament that they ran back the very same journey that they've made with Jesus. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, what did Jesus do? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That means right from Genesis all the way to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi, God is telling us about his son, he is telling us how he's going to be born. He's telling us where he's going to be born. He tells us his name in advance. He tells us what Jesus is going to be like. He tells him how he's going to be feeling. He tells us what he's going to do. And he tells us how important Jesus is to us. The Old Testament is one of the best places to go if you want to know more about our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the first passages, one of the first chapters in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, we read about God giving curses to the serpent 
and it being that Eve will produce a seed and it will crush the serpent's head and the serpent will bruise his heel. And we know that this speaks of Jesus dying for us, but crushing death so that we may have eternal life through him. In Numbers in chapter 21, we have the children of Israel walking through the wilderness. And Moses has to lift up a bronze serpent so that the children of Israel who had sinned against God may look at it. And if they believed, they would be saved. And it amplifies perfectly what we have to do. We have to look to Jesus to be saved. 1 Samuel chapter 16 is David, the descendant of Jesus, being anointed and God proclaiming, that his, that David's children will be on the throne, and that children, child, will be on the throne, was Jesus. Psalm 22 talks about how Jesus felt while he was on the cross. It talks about how his limbs felt, how his heart felt, how he felt like wax, the pain and the suffering that the Romans did to those that they wanted to have a horrific death. You don't get that in the New Testament. When we read about it in the New Testament, it just says, and they crucified him. The Old Testament, using Psalm 22 and many other verses and chapters, give us the very emotions, the very feelings that Jesus went through. And Psalm 22 ends talking about salvation talking about the kingdom the very thing that allowed jesus to get through what he was going through for us isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 still moving through the old testament it talks about a virgin conceiving and bearing a son something completely impossible within this world but not impossible with god therefore we can see the very power that god has and how he is the creator and sustainer of all things. And then in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, the very last book of the Old Testament, it says, The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. So we can see that the Old Testament is a focal point. It is focused on telling us about Jesus. We can see how proud God is of his Son and what he has done. And it shows us that God really is a father to all of us. And if we can come to him, then we have the best parent in the world. And included in all of these chapters and many others, we can see God's purpose for the world. He created the world for mankind. And mankind, through its arrogance and folly, chose to try and be like him. And yet the only way that we can be similar is by being humble and by trying to be as much as like Jesus as possible. And we can start by reading the Old Testament and learning more about Jesus and what he was like. The Old Testament is crucial as well for understanding where sin came from and also what this serpent actually was in the Garden of Eden. When you look at many different faiths around the world, many different denominations of Christians, they all see the devil or the serpent as a spiritual fallen angel, one that competes with God and talks on the shoulders of men to try and entice them away to do his will instead of God's will. And yet... That clearly isn't the case. In Genesis chapter 1, where God starts creating the animals, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, God creates three main classes of creature that live by breathing and living on the ground. The first one being the livestock, the second being the creeping thing, and the third being a beast of the earth. And these were the most wild and carnal of all. And we see that all of these creatures that God made, he says, were good, which we read about at the end of the day. 
but they had no spiritual understanding. They live and they die. They return to the dust that they were made from. However, when we go to verse 26, we see that man is made in the image of God and therefore he has a spiritual understanding. He has a conscience. He has intellect. But we also see that he's made in the same manner as the creatures because he's made as made of the dust of the earth. Therefore, he has a beast like a carnal nature. And going on, then we read in verse 28 that man and woman were given dominion over all of the crea creatures on the earth. Therefore, we can actually see that man and woman were given dominion over the beast of the field, which includes the serpent. In chapter 2, verse 19, we also see that of the creatures made of the ground, Adam named them. So not only does Adam have dominion over the serpent, he named him, and therefore the serpent couldn't have been beforehand. He can't be a fallen angel or anything similar to that. He was a simple beast of the field that Adam had dominion over and had named and finally, when we get to chapter 3 and verse 1, we read that the serpent was more crafty or cunning, depending on what version we're using, than any, of, than any of the other beasts of the field. We can compare this with chapter 2, verses 25, where it says that men and women were naked. Now, if you look at the Hebrew word for the naked, it's the word Aram. And the word for the crafty of the snake is Urum. So the only, there's only a vowel difference. We can see that they're very similar in concept and come from the same root word. Therefore, Adam and Eve had to choose between spiritual clothing and following God's word or becoming more like the serpent and realizing their nakedness and accepting their carnal nature and becoming more like the beast of the field of which they were made similar to. Unfortunately, as we do read in Genesis chapter 3, Eve chose to follow the serpent and Adam chose his wife over God. And hence they became a carnal being subject to death because they had sinned, much like every other animal that God had made. They then tried to hide this very nature by covering themselves in fig leaves. But here we see that the Old Testament shows us that it was God who provided a blood sacrifice, the first atonement, a covering for sin. And that is how we know that sin came into this world. It was by man choosing to follow his own desires and not God's. What is important to note is that even after they decided to follow the serpents, man was still given dominion over the serpent, it was never taken away in the curses that God inflicted upon the earth, upon the serpent, and upon the woman. Therefore, if the spiritual angel, as people say, was true, then Adam and Eve would actually have had dominion over it, which we know couldn't be, because man has no dominion over anything spiritual. And therefore, we see that the serpent has to be a carnal being. And therefore, we can see that man has his own choice every day to make, whether he to give in to his carnal nature or whether he wants to live his life spiritually for God. And therefore, we see the big contrast of the Christadelphians and many other denominations just focused here in the first three chapters of Genesis and so many people get it wrong and that's why the Old Testament is so important for a good understanding of God's word. We also see in Genesis and the creation it's very much an aspect of light versus dark where God calls out the light from the darkness and so we are called to come out of the darkness of this world and into the light of God and his son. Another aspect is the examples of people that we can actually relate to. Relate to. We have Ruth, 
who was a Gentile by birth, and yet by following in her mother-in-law's footsteps and returning to the children of Israel, by her hard work, she was recognised by those around her and actually became part of the descendants of Jesus. One of the phrases that Ruth uses is whatever you tell me to do, I will do. And that's very much one of the things that we too have to follow. If God says that we are to do something, then we are to do it because we know that he is in total control and what his will is, is best for us. We then come to Elijah, a man who had what we might say a rough life, but an interesting life. We first read of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17, when he declares that there will be a drought in the land of Israel and how he goes to live with a widow after being at a brook for a certain amount of time. And I think any of us would have been quite staggered of being able to proclaim that there had been a drought for a certain amount of time over an entire nation. And yet, to Elijah, this is just one of the many things that he had to do in the service of God. And then when it comes to the widow, the widow's child dies, and Elijah, as though nothing again happens, speaks to God and is able to raise the widow's son. Following on from that, the end of the drought comes at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. And here we see Elijah, the prophet of God, versus the idol worshippers, the prophets of Baal. And Elijah sets for them the impossible challenge, which we know was only possible through God's intervention. He sets up a, a challenge where they have to build an altar and sacrifice an offering on it, but they can't set fire to the offering themselves. They have to call upon their God to do the igniting, to set fire to the sacrifice. And it is by this means that the children of Israel will be able to know who is the true God. And the prophets of Baal, they scream, they shout, they cut themselves. And Elijah even goes on to mock them because, of course, their God isn't the true God. And, of course, no fire comes down. Elijah, so confident is he in his God's power, in his belief, that he soaks the offering, the altar, in water multiple times. And, of course, God delivers upon Elijah's prayer and burns the offering and burns up the altar as well. Do you think that Elijah would have been on quite a high? Here he is proving to his own people that his God is the true God. And yet we see a very much human emotion in Elijah in the very next chapter, in 1 Kings 19, when the king of Israel, Ahab's wife, Jezebel, hears about what Elijah has done and wants to try and kill him. And Elijah, having just performed these these miracles, these absolute wonders that God has done and shown his power to the very people he's been trying to convert and to turn back to God, he turns tails and flees. He's had enough. The man who is able to turn to God for pretty much anything, who is able to depend on God, just says he's had enough and he wants to die. And we see in these examples in the Old Testament how everyone who we may think was absolutely perfect, who never did anything wrong, who never had any issues, themselves were very human and experienced exactly what we feel pretty much every day today. And they had God interacting with them on a daily basis and doing miraculous instance that we only read about and can only dream about seeing at the moment. We then have Moses, who we see pretty much in every stage of his life. We see how he was born in Egypt at a time when the Pharaoh wanted to kill all newborn babies. 
and how after being rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, he is raised in the Egyptian palace, raised as a prince. And although he still has his faith in God, he is very much a man who is full of his own strength. We see in Exodus chapter 2 verses 1 to 14, how he goes about trying to bring about God's purpose by killing an Egyptian to save his fellow Israelites. He's very much a young man who is full of his own strength and has yet to learn any dependence or reliance on God. He then has to flee to Midian because of this fear of killing the Egyptian. And it's here that he meets his wife and is given his task by God to return to Egypt to rescue his people. And we actually see the development that Moses has gone through at this time, where he's no longer full of his own strength. He's past all of that. And he's so scared to go back that God essentially has to encourage him and call up his brother Aaron to come and do it with him. Despite having been shown wonders and miracles at the burning bush with his hand becoming leprous and then being healed afterwards, still he's scared. And this is Moses, who was given the Ten Commandments, who was given the law, who led the people of Israel through the wilderness. We see that he did not have the courage or the strength because he had learnt that by himself he could not achieve anything but that God himself achieves everything. And of course, then we read about his exploits as he goes through the wilderness with the children of Israel, as he pleads for them to be saved, as they're worshipping the golden calf at the foot of the mountain, and his anger at them when he comes down and realises what they've done. He is a human but a human that is able to be humble enough to follow God in everything that he does. And finally, we have Hebrews chapter 11, where it goes through the many examples that we can try and follow and who are still waiting for God's promises and prophecies to come about so that more of us can actually be baptised and come to God. And when we go through the list in Hebrews 11, Pretty much every single name listed on there is in the Old Testament. And we can go and we can read their stories and try and emulate their good parts and see where they have fallen short so that we too may avoid their mistakes. It also gives us glimpses of the kingdom. The Old Testament is brilliant for giving us hints and clues and visions of what God has in store for us. Just starting off with the Garden of Eden, where man walked with God, he talked with God. And isn't that what we all dream of being able to do, being able to talk with our creator? God also brought mist out from the ground at this time because it hadn't rained yet. And therefore he was given an easy Task. He was able to name the animals. It wasn't the hard slog nine till five that we do or whatever else jobs that we may have. God provided mankind. It wasn't until man fell that the curse was put on the earth because of what man had done. And despite of this curse, God gave days off. He gave us little bits like the seventh day, the seventh year, and the year of Jubilee, so that we could see, even just taste for a moment, the goodness that God has promised for us. When we read through God's creation, it says that God rested on the seventh day. And we know that God doesn't need to rest. God has worked every day since his creation. And if you read it, again, you'll notice that the first six days have an evening, have a, sorry, have a morning and an evening. The seventh day does not have an evening. It's an internal day, hinting that when that day comes, when the kingdom returns, it will be an eternal day for us all to join in. The Israelites were given the seventh year, an absolute incredible year, where they did not have to plant because God would provide all that they needed and they could spend that year 
celebrating that God had given them and being proud to be able to be called part of the people of Israel. And if you can do your maths every seventh year, if you do seven times seven, you get 49. So on the 49th year, they had the same thing where they did no work and they learnt reliance on God. And then on the 50th year, they had the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee was exactly the same in the seventh year. They were to do no work. They were not to plant, but yet again, God would provide for them. So with the 49th year and the 50th year, God gave his people two years without hard work. Two years of release from the curse that he placed on the earth in the third year. If you want a glimpse of the kingdom, he was giving it to his people long before the kingdom was ever established. We also have Solomon's reign, where David had set up the kingdom, where it followed God and all the surrounding nations. God had allowed David to conquer and subdue so that their riches were sent to Israel. And Solomon's reign was brilliant in the fact that Solomon was given wisdom after asking for it from God. And therefore, we've got the wisest man at that time, alive in a kingdom, prosperous, with peace, with wealth. So that other peoples like the Queen of Sheba travel to Israel to hear God's wisdom through Solomon. And we can only imagine what that can have been like. And we know that when the kingdom comes, people will grab the hem of those traveling to Jerusalem and say, let us come up with you. And that will be us when Jesus returns. That's what the Old Testament gives us. It gives us these glimpses. And then we also have the prophecies. We have Isaiah chapter 35, that talks about a rose blooming in the lonely place. We have Isaiah chapter 65, where it talks about the wolf and the lamb lying down. It talks about peace and a true peace. We look at this world and there's conflict. We look at this world and there are tears, there are wars, there is strife, there is corruption. There is viruses at the moment which are going nationwide and causing many issues. And God's given us a glimpse, just a tiny glimpse, like through a keyhole, of what he has promised, how he will wipe away every tear. And that's why the Old Testament is so needed, so brilliant. Because not only does God reveal how he will save us through his son, but he gives us the view of what is waiting for us if we do choose to follow him and why we should choose to follow him as well because he is the creator and he can wipe away every issue that this world has and replace it with a perfect order by doing his will thank you for listening mm -hmm.